All right, so I want to speak to you out of the subject within our series, Love is Extravagant Love. Extravagant love, okay? Love is, we've been speaking about giving. Yes, that subject that everybody loves in church and in the world, uh, because the church has never been spoken of in the sense of, you know, giving. Exactly. So we are talking about it from a different perspective, not because it needs to for the sake of rebranding it, but it's a true perspective because a lot of people talk tithing. A lot of people speak generosity. A lot of people speak this, that. And there's all these arguments that are centered around, should we, how much should we, do we have to? Let's just get out of that for a second because it's a, it's a slippery slope and it just, it's, it's like a rabbit hole. You just keep going down and it's just, it doesn't go anywhere. Because the real question is not what, but the motivation of why. Why? Jesus says it Himself, hey, yeah, great that you tithe, but you ignore the greater commandment of love. So it's not a strike against tithing as much as it's a motivational check that why are you giving? Because you could be the greatest tither in the world, never missed it, yet you are stingy with your forgiveness. You are stingy with your grace. Then I would have to debate that you don't give out of the right reason. You give because of what you might get. But are you really a person where the spirit of generosity has permeated into every little area of you or are you compartmentalised? Compartmentalisation will always allow you to, to, I guess, justify the means in which you give. Well, I give of my time, so I don't have to give of my talent. You know what? When you are generous, you are generous through and through. If you notice you can't be bitter in one area and it stays there. You know what I mean? You can't be cynical in one area and it stays there. You become cynical in one area, you become cynical about everything. Like someone says, hi, nice to meet you. And you're like, walk away. Yeah, I bet it's nice to meet me. Ooh, (laughs) teach you that at your church leadership class. Ooh, Mr. I have a people shirt on. I know what you're trying to do. Yeah, of course we know what we're trying to do. We're trying to connect you, duh. You know what I mean? But when you're cynical, you're like, oh, I know the game. You wouldn't speak to me if I was somewhere else. Just take it easy. Because the spirit permeates. And I want to highlight a woman in the Bible, Mary, uh, who does an extravagant action. One thing I've always known about extravagance, as I look back at it, is that it divides a room. Extravagance frustrates the stingy, locates the stingy, because they always have an opinion. Well, that's a bit wasteful, isn't it? Well, I wonder where that's going to go. Well, you know what? At the end of the day, if you gave because you gave to Him, you're not wondering where it's going to go. That doesn't let us off the hook. But I'm just saying, if you can't celebrate it, maybe there's an issue. If you can't celebrate your neighbour's win, there's an issue. If you can't celebrate someone else doing better than you, maybe there's an issue. And often what we can't celebrate is an indicator of what is broken in here. And maybe it's about recalibrating so we could be what God called us to be. So I hope you hear this message in all the heart that is given, I hope to present facts to you. I've got a million and one, not, that's impossible, verses uh, that I'm going to bring and I'm going to go through it. It's a different style message than what I usually do, but we're going to pour through it in the hopes that I can equip you to make the decisions that you need to make. Uh, we have not spoken on this topic in five years other than three different messages over five years. The reason being, we really, I guess, in hindsight, feel like God always led us to love people, steward their gifts before we steward their giving. And uh, if you've been here any amount of time, you realise that I don't do a giving message. We don't do a giving message every week. I just basically, we just say, thank you for your gift. If you're new or visiting, take this service as our gift to you. You know how we do it, People Church. Done. And most of the time I even forget doing it. And you guys, you know, I just forget it. And some people go, that's awesome that he doesn't care about it. No, I'm just forgetful. So <laughs> trust me, when I get to Monday, I'm like, you know what I mean? And I actually, I hit myself a little bit too hard there. <laughs> it's one of the woes of working out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Um, okay, so six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Man, six days before Passover. That's incredible. That that's, I mean, just because we know what Passover is, it's uh, a moment where Jesus, uh, where God saves His people uh, and creates a meal, much like communion, centered around a remembrance of His salvation. It's quite incredible that 
It all happens at the same time. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I've got to say this about extravagance. It fills the room. Extravagance cannot be ignored. Extravagance will snap your attention. Extravagance is something that will put worth on somebody. And I know it's not the only way to put worth on it. If that was your initial thought, well then, I know, we all know, okay? We all know it's not the only way. But I gotta tell you, generosity is a incredible way to be extravagant with your words, extravagant with your actions, extravagant with your finance. And by the way, when the Spirit permeates, it's not one in lieu of the other, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, sometimes we do that in a means to justify what we don't wanna give. You know, the one area that you often can't give is the one area that you need to. Because there's a reason that you cannot be generous with your forgiveness. You quite often just don't understand it. And what we see here is it fills the room. And like I said, it always divides a room, right? Always divides a room. Let's go to the next bit. It says this, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, you gotta say Judas' name like that, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why? Objections out of a stingy heart always sound good at face value, don't don't they? They just sound so good at face value. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As the keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Hey, this is why we only, the reason that we argue how much we should give and if we should give is because we want to keep it. Do you know what I mean? Like, have you ever, I've learned with my children, they're they're still learning how to like uh, uh, negotiate. So sometimes they'll be like, I'll give you this Batman toy (laughs) if you give me. And I'm like, and often the trade is completely unfair. (laughs) And I just don't hold on to it because obviously I don't care about it. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, sure. Take this loaf of bread which always ends up a bad idea because they're doing an experiment with it that I wish they didn't do when I come back to it. I'm like, I never thought you could do that with a loaf of bread. (laughs) God bless your creativeness, but still. See, you hold on to what you wanna keep. And the reason we argue first about should we have to, do we have to, is because we wanna keep it. But here's the thing, you count what you care about most. Mary did not count what she was giving up. She counted who she was giving it up for. Judas counted what was being given up, even though it wasn't even his. See, a stingy heart will not just monitor their own gift, but everybody else's in the room. A stingy person will come in and be uncomfortable with the extravagance. And yes, I gotta say that as the church worldwide, we have not done great with this. The church has done this out of the wrong motivation for many years, taught to manipulate and guilt. But why don't we take that out of the context for a moment and ask this simple thing in the pattern of what Jesus did for us. He, God gave His only Son and His Son walked to the cross for you and I, did an extravagant act of love for humanity, gave something that was more than enough. Why? So that we could be close. What if our giving didn't take on debates on on if I have to, if I need to, shoulda, woulda, coulda. What if our giving took on the same Spirit of our God sending His Son? What if our giving came to love our people, love our God, an expression of putting Him first that we might reach people and bring them close through an extravagant gift that this church could give towards this city and cities of the world in such a fashion that it makes people say things like, why did I, what did I do to deserve this? Why is someone paying for my college? I don't get it. Why has somebody paid for our mortgage this month? We don't understand. Why has somebody built a whole establishment that costs money to care for the forgotten in our city? Why are we building schools in the South and the West Side where everyone else seems to think that they should be shut down? Why, 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 why? Because extravagance makes you ask the question. And when you ask the question, we've got an opportunity to tell them the reason. See, I don't even wanna argue about how much you think you have to give and if you should. I wanna speak about a heart that is loving. Love always leans to generosity. 
So let's talk about giving for a second. What does the Bible say about it? What does it even talk about? When, what, how, where, how does it happen? Let's go through a whole bunch of verses for it. Genesis 14, 20, and praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies in your hand. Then Abraham gave, Abram gave him a tenth of everything. This is pre-law, meaning it was not mandated at this point, right? So why did it, do, why, did, why, why, why? Seems like the only possible conclusion is it came out of our want to not a have to. Abraham did this because he wanted to give God a gift. But beyond that, it's talking about a tenth of everything, meaning 10%. 10% of everything he owned, he gave back to God. Why? Well, we know this, that God just came through for him. So out of, a, out of what God did for him, he was inspired and moved to give back to God. Does God need it? No, He can create it. Abram did it because of what God did for him. So what we start to see, we're gonna see a case building where even before it was expected, those who loved God gave it undirected. They just did it because of what God did for them. Next, please, thank you. Uh, And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Again, Abram saying, what you give me, I will give back to you. What you give me, I will give. Seems like a good deal. Because if God knows you're going to be a good steward and you're going to prioritise God, there might be a sense of reward in it, not that that's why we do it. Exodus 13, 1, 2 says this, uh, verse 1 to 2 says this, The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male, the first offspring of every uh, womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. We're going to hold on this one for a bit. This whole principle you see again in Leviticus, you see again in Numbers, and it's kind of, it talks about a simple thing that the first of our fruits, the firstborn is God's. And if we are not going to, and, and basically we either have to buy it back or redeem it. So this is why in Leviticus, it commands that we would sacrifice our first of our livestock, a perfect, you know, unblemished lamb to then buy back and redeem our firstborn child. Because obviously God's not into us sacrificing our children. So He's like, buy it back. And this is the way you buy it back. Again, we start to see a theme building of first things first, putting God first and realising that He is provider and out of that provision we give and that starts to consecrate, separate, bless the rest. We see this. And you've got to understand this, that all through the Bible, you're going to see opportunities where God has set things aside that are not to be touched. Opportunities for faithfulness through exclusion and giving. The tree in the garden, it was the only thing we weren't to touch. Why? It was something that He commanded. Again, an expression of God. We have reserved a space in our heart that we give you and we honour with what is most difficult to do so. Everything. Our everything, right? Go to the, do, is, do I have another one in there? Leviticus 27.30 says this, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitutions. Basically saying, we don't choose what we give, we give what is first. Again, if Jesus came not to abolish the law and not to fulfil the law, the statement says, but to fulfil the purpose of the law, it means this. Before the law, God wanted relationship with us. We mess that up. He provides the law as a means to come back to Him, as a means for knowing how to relate to Him. That messes up. So He sends what the Bible tells us, a better covenant. And that covenant is Jesus as a perfect sacrifice that brings us back towards God, right? And brings us in close relationship with Him. So Jesus comes in as a way to bring us back. So He came to fulfil the law, right? Fulfil it, fulfil its purpose. Meaning there's a reason why God asks for everything beyond just doing it. I grew up with a mother that just said no. And I'd be like, why? And she'd go, because I said no. And then if I said why again, she just did this. Which was nice because she always tested my vision first. She was like, you see this? And I was like. God did not say no for no sake. He created things with a endeavour, an endeavour to structure a way for us to put Him first. Why? Because what He wants more than anything, not your time, not your finance, He wants your heart. And out of your heart, these gifts flow. 
love is. So if we look at giving from a post-Jesus perspective, what we realise is there is plenty of evidence to tell us that we must bring these things to our God. There is plenty of evidence to say that we should give Him the first. I like to put it this way. What would you rather have? The first 10% of a burrito or the last 10% of a burrito? (laughs) If someone said, I love you so much, I give you my last 10% of my burrito. You would say, I love you too, but do not come near me with with the 10% remaining of your slobber. We want to give the best, right? So how do we look at this now that we are not under compulsion? We don't have to do this. What do we do? Well, I want to bring you two points that hopefully correct our view on what it is to give and how we should give. We know that we're supposed to. I'm not going to major today on this service about the benefits of doing so, even though we know that there's many. And we're going to get into that in the weeks to come. But because I, I don't want to give out of that. I want to give out of we want to give, right? I want to give because we get it. Not because we have to. We don't treat millionaires bif- different than we treat billionaires in this place. Get it? No? Cool. All right. We treat everyone the same, you know? Whether you're giving a lazy million or a lazy billion, we love you all the same. We don't do that because we don't want to treat someone who gives financially different than somebody that doesn't. I don't know how much you give or if you give. So if this verse starts making you, this sermon makes you uncomfortable, you're like, he knows. I don't know, okay? I have no clue. You could give a dollar or 50 cents. There was one person in the early days of our church when I did know all these things. He kept giving a dollar on his credit card, but it would would cost us more to process his giving (laughs) than his giving. I used to pray every week, please just let him. We, we needed every cent back in those days too. We were going backwards. I was like, please Lord, let him give cash because <laughs> it costs us more to process his faithfulness. <laughs> so these are my two points to help us correct and have a good perspective on this subject, okay? Number one is this. We don't have to, we get to. We get to. Point number one, we get to. Okay, this is what we find. There is a whole bunch of moments in the Bible where God shows us that our giving is an opportunity for us to partner with His plan. Whether it be through your gift, your time, or your resource, your finance, we get to do this. Well, Chris, where do we see that? Well, we see it here in Nehemiah. We see it uh, where basically He gathers everybody. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storehouse. So we see that when it came time to rebuilding the wall, who provided the, the ability to, pre, to, to build the wall? It was God's people, right? Whose plan was it to rebuild the wall? God's plan. We partner with God through our talent because people were talented at building the wall. They also gave of their resource and they also gave of their time. Go over to the next verse for me. This is when they're getting together. Well, this is Haggai verse one, three to four says this, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It is a time for you to, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while the house remains in ruins? Referencing that is it a time for us to care more about our own goods when the house of God lies in ruins. Would you say that the house of God is a resemblance of what it needs to be around the earth right now? Would you say that this house is a resemblance of what it needs to be right now? Because at the end of the day, it's saying, if you concern yourself, how can you concern yourself? The question God asks, with your own, when mine is left in ruins. We see a lot of heart motivation, not have to. Nobody wants to be loved because they have to. God is not any different. So what we see in the next verse, in Exodus, it says, they received from Moses all the offerings and the Israelites brought to carry out the work of construction of the sanctuary and the people continued. I don't have time to go through it all, but it's there, Exodus 36, three to five. You can, you can see it for yourself, write it down. Basically what happens, the people had to bring to build the tabernacle. They brought so much, so much, that they had to tell them to stop. Extravagance. Wouldn't it be good to have to tell our church to stop instead of start? Again, the people did what? With what they had, they partnered with what? God's plan. 
We see it again when uh, Solomon built the, built the temple. They brought everything they had to what? Build the house of God. Again, we see it in Acts when the people come together and the Holy Spirit falls and all of a sudden everything's happening. Thousands being added to the church daily. What happens? They all had everything in common, meaning that they all gave up everything so that they could all live at the same level. I gotta say this about the recent acts that have happened in our nation that are a highlight of just where our nation is at, that I think we cannot stay silent. We cannot stay silent because what I hate about living in a politically correct world is that we love to sit on the fence because we are afraid to be deemed of being on the wrong side of something. But the problem with that is this, that your silence is just as bad as doing nothing at all. In fact, it's, and, and so when it comes to how we love our city and, and, and how we step up and do what God's called us to do, we've got to remember that this city needs to be loved on and our nation needs to be loved on. And we've got to do something that allows us to bring that love in practical form and action because actions speak louder than words. We as a church can say we are loving. We as a church can say that we want to change the world, but it's not our words that people will feel, it's our actions. You can't fake love when you make love an action. Somebody can tell you they love you. Somebody can tell you they want to be with you. But an action of proposal is better than saying, I want to be with you. That's for some. So we see that they sold everything so that everybody could come together and build the house. What do we see there? We see again that our giving lines up with God's plan and we get to do something. Third one is, fourth one or fifth one is this. We all know the the, the verse where they feed the thousands through the little boy's offering of the fish and the loaves, right? We all know it. it. Even if you don't know it, just say, yeah, I know it. We all know it, right? Happens. Do you know there's about 20,000 people there that day? Let's just contextualise. Is it probable, I know it's possible, but is it probable that this boy was the only one with food? 20,000 people and this guy's the only guy? This little boy of all people. Little boy. Not even thinking about anything other than playing. He thinks to himself, man, there's gonna be a crowd out there today and I'm gonna be like, it's gonna be like Lollapalooza. I'm gonna be crowded all there. I'm gonna be able to get through places. Yeah, I'm gonna pack my own picnic. I know it's nerdy and none of the other kids do it, but I'm packing fish and I'm packing loaves. When everyone's there with no food, he's like, who's laughing now? No, I don't think so. Maybe he was the only one willing to give. All through the Bible, we have been part of God's miracle, whether it be through laying on of hands, walking out to different places and showing love, picking people up, praying for the sick. It requires an action on our part. And maybe we remember this uh, this amazing miracle from the wrong perspective or a lack of perspective, because yes, we are amazed at what God did. But first, let's see what was put in God's hands in order for Him to do something great. Are we missing out on something that the world will talk about because we are not giving what God has called calling us to give? Are we just like the rest of the crowd that is unwilling to part with what God has given them so that God can do what He's created this world to experience? Maybe He wasn't the only one with food. He was the only one willing to part with it. And when He parted with it, God did something with it. We don't have to give. We get to give. We get to be a part of what God is doing. We get to build His house. If you are sitting there still in this message going, I'm convinced, you're missing out. And if you're getting here and getting frustrated, tell me what I've said that is unbiblical. Tell me how I've coerced you. Tell me how I've guilted you. I don't think you'll find it. The reality is, if we have an issue with this extravagance, it's because we have an issue with extravagance. It's because we have an issue with giving. It's because we have an issue in this area of our life. And by the way, if you're good at tithing, but you can't love your wife, you don't get giving. You don't get generosity. Generosity doesn't get you off the hook. Tithe is not a bribe. Tithe is an expression of love for your Saviour and humanity. Second thing is this. Second point is this. We don't have to, we want to. We want to. For God so loved the world, He sent His only Son. God has always been giving, God has always been loving, and He loved you enough to send His Son. Did He have to? No. 
He wanted to. Do we have to give? Oh, but what, what does giving look like? Is it tithe? Is it, is it, and is it just of my words? Is it, uh, uh, shouldn't it be just what my heart wants to give? Yes, it should be what your heart wants to give, but hopefully your heart always wants to give in every area, across every day, across every moment. You're generous with your words. You're generous with your forgiveness. You're generous with your acts. You're, gen- you're generous with your love. You're generous with your praise. You're generous with your worship. David said this, I will not bring you that which costs me nothing. He wanted it to cost something. Why? Because it's a heart thing. It's something that I want to give you. And if it's of no worth to me, why would I give it? It's supposed to hurt a little because it's a gift, a sacrifice given to someone you love. We don't do this because we have to. We do this because we want to. Second Corinthians, I believe, is gonna come up, but it speaks of giving and the condition of our heart as we do so. Can I encourage you? You don't have to give, but you gotta get to a point where you want to give. Not wanting to does not let you off the hook. My heart has not been moved. If your heart has not been moved in years, maybe it needs moving. Lord has not prompted me. La, 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 la. That's how we go through it sometimes. I know this, love is. Love is an action. Love is generous. Love is kind. Love is. Love is not a bunch of words. For all the Christians in the world who claim they love Jesus, all the theologians in the world that know so much, but all their knowing is not equated to more love, do you even know Him? Because to know Him, the Bible says, is to love our neighbours as we love ourselves. You know Him, you love yourself more and you love people. It's a, it's, it's a byproduct. you can't help it. We don't give because we have to. We give because we want to. We give because of what He gave to us. We follow and we model our giving, not off law, but off grace. Grace is a gift that seems wasteful. It's more than enough. He forgave even those who were rejected. He died even for those that put Him on the cross. He died for us all, like wasted love, but it's not wasted because He did it, being faithful to His Father and out of His love for humanity. We don't give because we have to at People Church. We give because we want to. What do we want to do? We want to honour our Father. From the beginning, we see that there's a space to put Him first, an opportunity to give Him first. This is what I've always known about God. He's a really good space filler. There's a experiential theology brought out there by us that often says that until we hit rock bottom, God doesn't get involved sometimes. He just needed us to hit rock bottom. Think about that for a second. God did not need you to hit rock bottom. When? Why? makes no sense. I just need them angels to hit rock bottom. If you don't hear the smack of the thud of them hitting the rocks, do not step in. I commandeth you. No. Better said, we just don't invite Him in until we hit rock bottom. We need to hit rock bottom sometimes before we wake up and get Him in. But what happens the moment we let Him in? Something changes. God needs space to move. And if there is no space in your love, if there is no space in your relationship, if there is no space between what you can do and you can't do, where does God fit? Is there space in your finances for God to come through? Is there space in your budget for Him to prove Himself faithful? If there's no space, how can you know or not know whether He is or isn't gonna be there? Have you structured your life with space for God? I believe this, personal revelation. As I've given God space and giving and every other area of my life, it's opened up my heart to keep giving Him space. As I give Him space, He shows up. When He shows up, He shows off. I grow in faith and I can do it all over again. The more space I give Him, the more He steps in. I gotta tell you this, that it's an intentional endeavour to give God space. It doesn't make sense to give God space. It didn't make sense for David to take on a giant with nothing but some stones, but he gave God space. It didn't make sense to walk into the wilderness without provisions, but they gave God space. It doesn't make sense to say, Jesus, I am at my last here, but come into my heart. I can't see you, but I feel you. It doesn't make sense, but you give Him space. If you give God space, He'll fill it. And I think there's a great power to being realigned by our giving and allowing God to do what only God can do. 
So I want to set you up with a challenge this week. A lot of churches do this thing. I don't feel quite comfortable about it, but they do this thing where it's like a tithe challenge. You tithe for three months, they keep it in a separate account. If you don't feel like God showed up, they give it back to you, right? I don't know, I don't know why I don't like it. Maybe because I don't like gimmicky things. It's not a gimmick, it's actually cool. I mean, good on you. Like, but I just don't, I don't know. But I will say this. Why don't you see if God will speak to you about actioning this love that you have? Chris, I already do so and I've been praying for months. Cool. But as I know my children, my love for them grows. And if my love grows, the way I loved Audrey in our first year of marriage should not be the way that I love her in our 10th year of marriage. Because if my love has not grown, you've got to ask, is it there at all? And secondly, love, if it's not growing, it's not staying stagnant. It comes under the law of entropy where if it's left to itself, it will die. What are you doing to fuel greater love? How are you stepping out today as a Christian in greater ways than you did yesterday? Because we know this, the further you step out, the more He steps in. If you're going and growing comfortably, you've got to ask a question about that. I'm talking to everybody. I can't set what God is going to call you to do. I don't even know if He will, but I hope that He brings to light areas in your life that you practically need to love more. Maybe some of you have been the most faithful tithers that have ever existed, but maybe love needs to go beyond that. Maybe love has to become generous, not just have to. Maybe it has to become generous in the way you approach your workplace. When was the last time you actually loved became generous with your gift in your workplace or do you just give your boss what he pays for? Because your extravagant giving will make a way. It'll divide and fill a room. It'll help people know. So let me put it this way. As we wrap up, if we were to give because we don't have to, but we get to and we love to, let me tell you what giving could look like. Buildings aside, because obviously we are gonna need one. In fact, it's annoying to have to rent something for almost the price of what we have to buy one and have no access to it. But that's not our major goal. We at the moment provide a $5 um, lift code so that people can get to church from all over the city. What if we could extend that to be $15 so that the single mother that can't get here can get here? What if we could then create a program where we loved on our city and those who didn't get the opportunity for college, we could pay for out of extravagant love and gifting. What if we could come in and pay for a single mother's like whole bills and and year of expenses because she's carrying children and the father is absent? What if we could do that? What would that say about us? And what would it say about God? Because one thing I've learned is the gift says nothing about the receiver and everything about the giver. It says nothing about the receiver, but this says something about the giver. What if our love married that which God has done for us? What if we gave so, so well that we could close children and send them back to school well? What if we could help homeless people, the the forgotten in our city, the downtrodden? What if we could do something that would change lives? What if we could start schools in our south and west side? What if we could, I don't know, start our own university? What if we could start bringing water where they can't get water in in, in in the places around the world? What if? What if we could help people live a better life because of our extravagance? What if we could love our children and every time they come to children's church, there's a gift they're waiting for them, a service that makes them go, wow. What if we could do tangible things to love on our city where the government can't afford to do it, we can step in. What if we could do this? Not better cars, not better buildings. Yes, we need a building, but if that's as big as your vision gets as a church, I think you've missed it. We need to be a church that loves on a city extravagantly so much so that Chicago, Detroit, Barcelona, Madrid, Tokyo would look back and go, I don't even know these people, but this is something different about the church I've never seen before. They're not into building buildings or brands. They're into building something that is greater and longer lasting than that. We need to rebuild the walls in our city and we need to rebuild the walls in the nations around the world. And it cannot be done alone and it cannot be done out of have to. It's gotta be done out of want to, get to. That could change the world. What if? sitting there on Facebook arguing about whether we have to. And if you're sitting there wondering what we might do with it, I think we've proven we've been pretty good with that. And secondly, you gotta know you're not giving out of your motivation. If the only reason you're giving is because it's gonna do something great, you missed it. You always give to God first. And out of that gift to God, good things happen. Church, we're gonna keep teaching on this. I believe that this subject has hurt people, but it shouldn't. 
I believe that this subject has become what allows there to be a noose over the vision of our church and churches worldwide because we get so caught up with have to that we miss the greater law of loving and getting to and wanting to. I hope that this week you ask the question to God, God, what, how? And address every area of your life. God, I need to be more generous in every area of my life, my giving financially, my time, my talent. Some people in this room have been called to ministry and you will not give your gift to God because you're afraid of whether you could be compensated for it. You don't trust Him. Your gift is needed. So right now, we're going to stand and we're going to take communion.